Thanks for the introduction. Okay, we are going to have a duo lecture. Uh, as I already mentioned, Anna and I will do the half of the presentation. Uh, today we are, uh, we are trying to uh, bring some uh, new perspectives on the future of cultural heritage from out of uh, projects in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, we are operating in a studio called RAAF. Uh, it's a studio that's operating at the crossing border of art, architecture and science. So, uh, the last word affordances means uh, that's the philosophical, uh, the, the part of uh, philosophy in our office. Uh, my brother is uh, a philosopher. Affordances means tools for um, action provided by the environment. Very important in the projects. We will come back to that later on. The crossing border. Uh, actually, the studio is a small studio consisting out of three people and a small group around it with, with a few uh, freelancers. And uh, my brother and I are the founders of uh, RAF, and Anna joined the studio in uh, 2009, and she's part of the core design team. Uh, the studio started with uh, uh, winning the Prix de Rome in uh, 2006. That was uh, uh, the starting point not only of the, uh, of the studio, but also of a way of uh, looking to, uh, um, to heritage, but also to spatial planning and designing. Actually, our approach on uh, strategic interventions has been developed in this, uh, in this first project. This is uh, an area in the middle of the dunes in the Netherlands along the coast, which was actually a seemingly impossible area to do something. And what we try to do is by creating a new, completely new landscape, changing the perspective of the heavy steel industry over there, turning it into a kind of winter bathing resort. So it became the first hot spring of uh, Western Europe. Um, it's a way of looking and uh, changing the position in this uh, uh, context of heritage from the Atlantic Wall, which became bathing houses as part of a hot spring. What we often try to do is either changing an object or changing the context of an object uh, in order to get new ways of use. Um, we wrote a book two years ago called Vacancy Studies. And it's called uh, Strategic Interventions and Experiments in Architecture. And that's where it is uh, all about today. Strategic Interventions is part, if you look to the projects, because we will illustrate our projects on heritage, um, um, uh, our, our design approach, we will illustrate that with uh, projects. But it's important to keep in mind that there is a whole way of thinking behind that. It's too complex to go into that in depth now, because it's complex, but it means Actually, strategic interventions are precisely chosen and carefully designed interventions that set new developments in motion. A lot of words, we're trying to make it clear uh, in the projects. One of the first um, uh, projects um, I'm going to show is uh, Fake It L. It was in 2010. We were asked by the Ministry of Culture and Science to think about an important topic in uh, spatial planning. And we came up with uh, vacant uh, heritage, cultural heritage. 10,000 uh, governmentally uh, owned buildings are vacant currently, and we don't know what to do with it. And this is, uh, for example, the pavilion in Venice, uh, on the biennial, uh, Venice Architecture Biennial, an important moment every two years where uh, lots of countries show their new visions on the future. So what we actually discovered is that this Pavilion is on Dutch soil in Venice, and it's similar to the topic in the Netherlands, namely uh, 10,000 uh, vacant and governmental, uh, governmental buildings. This is also a governmental building. So we had to make an exhibition um, uh, about this topic, and we are talking about such type of buildings. This is in a radio broadcast station, but there are 10,000 buildings like you have to imagine, for example, churches, monasteries, monasteries, bunkers, fortresses, lighthouses. This is actually all heritage where we have all been paying for during centuries because it's uh, governmentally owned in this, uh, and we have all been paying tax for it. What we wanted to show was actually the amount and the potential of this heritage also in the meantime because it's vacant property and it's also vacant for a period for sometimes three months but also sometimes 20 years. So what are we going to do in the meantime? An important topic. So not just talking, but come up with new ideas of use in the meantime. And we made a connection to a governmental agenda. Um, you can see here a big book, and it's called the Dutch Atlas of Vacancy. 
So every single building has been analyzed on its potential for the future. You can see it here, the map. This is Netherlands and this uh, 10,000 buildings. And we try to not to design everything, but to, to sketch the potential for the future of these buildings. Here you just see one page of, of the churches from the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st century. So, for example, what can you do with it? Opening up new perspectives in the meantime, for example, making open fire or producing 150 dB uh, to start a strike fighter. It's uh, within a building. It sounds uh, a bit strange, but we will come back to that later with a real project. So, this here in the corner is uh, military airbase Soesterberg, and I will uh, tell about the project later on what, how we deal with this uh, um, topic. So we actually approached to use these buildings in the meantime for knowledge development and connected governmental agendas on this. Also looking from a regional perspective towards the buildings, and actually it's all about potential. Um, what we often do is making visions, so actually each project is a build manifesto, you could see this project as a build manifesto. And there was uh, the, the director of the Central Museum in Utrecht, who wants, it is in the middle of the Netherlands, who wants to buy this installation from Venice. And that's what we actually never do, because we make site-specific work. So what we said, you can buy this installation, but we translate it to your uh, chapel, to your space. So it's actually the inverted uh, version of Venice. So, and now it's also becoming part of the collection in uh, the Netherlands. It's important because it's a long-term uh, vision. So we got many publicity on this, and we wanted to also to test things in reality. Uh, so it's, this was a, a moment in time, 2010, and we wanted to make uh, real projects with it. And I'm going to show you a few uh, different type of projects. I think Anna will come back uh, with uh, Secret Operation on Soesterberg on this uh, agenda as well. Um, but these are uh, the projects I'm going to show now are important projects in, uh, on cultural heritage in the Netherlands, namely the new Dutch water line. It's an 80 kilometers long area in the Netherlands, and it has been an, a national project for uh, about 10 years. I think the Netherlands were very progressive on cultural heritage 15 years ago. Um, currently, they are not uh, that progressive anymore. I think Sweden is doing the best to come up with new ideas, and I think in the end that will work out as well. But I want to show you some uh, results of this vision and ambition 15 years ago in the Netherlands. So this was an 80 kilometers long project in the middle of the Netherlands, close to the Randstad, a very densely populated area. It used to be a military defense structure, and it's now uh, vacant as well. It's, it is actually uh, used as uh, agricultural uh, land, but uh, many um, buildings and objects have been left over, about seven to 800 uh, uh, objects. And uh, to work with cultural heritage, it's of course important to understand uh, where you're working on. The new Dutch water line was, used to be a flooded area during wartime, and uh, it consists out of a lot of layers, many fortresses and bunkers at places which could not be flooded. The idea was to keep Germany away from the, coming from the east by uh, making a big water line. That worked in the First World War, but not in the Second. And the question is how to articulate this military heritage, which has no function anymore, and what are you going to do with it? We analyzed all typologies, 700 uh, bunkers in the new Dutch uh, waterline. But the question is, of course, what are you going to do with it? There are different kinds of clusters, fortresses and bunkers together, and they are organized along these big flooded uh, areas. You see here these kind of clusters. And I'm going to talk about this cluster because we did some projects over there. And this was actually a visionary municipality who had the, uh, the ambition to, to realize some projects um, uh, on articulating this, uh, the potential of this new Dutch water line. If it's, uh, for example, in the wintertime, it still seems to be a flooded area when the fog is coming over the uh, agricultural fields. So this, uh, within this cluster, there were 12 projects defined, and they all had a different... Uh, Treatment. So it's important not to want everything to be progressive. Also, you can also consolidate some uh, works. For example, this is a project. There were just there was just a renovation. Uh, here, this is going to be developed right now. It's a fortress. 
Uh, but also at other places along the riverside, uh, bunkers are revealed and making visible and becoming part of nature development. In, uh, and at other places, they made the accessibility of this the whole waterline to experience it for people just to enter these kind of areas. And one important project, a key project for us, was uh, Fort Werkanspool. Uh, that was one of the projects where we have been working on uh, for uh, five years, and we completed that because I think it's re making visions is difficult, good visions, but to complete them and to realize them is ten times more difficult. And this is an example of a fortress. It took five years to get it done. It was completely covered by uh, nature, and uh, yeah, actually it became a mess after the Second World War. And the, what, what, what was interesting is it's close by a city, a little city, and there was a lot of public engagement in advance, and we want to connect it, this to the, uh, to the fortress. So what we said, you should actually take these initiatives and use them in the design of the fort. And that doesn't mean that you are going to make too many compromises, but to try uh, to find a uh, kind of structure or an intervention uh, that gives the possibility to um, yeah, to generate new program. So that's what you see here. Actually, the whole design is a grass sculpture integrating historical ingredients from different periods and also new elements. So this is the base of the, the grass sculpture. This is the connecting structure. And what happened is, for example, we, the, uh, there is a big group programming an amphitheater. Every week there is a program. There is a kind of a new building. We didn't design it, but it's from the, uh, the Veldkeuken. It means it's kind of kitchen which cooks very good food. Um, and all kinds of little uh, uh, objects on the fort are reused by different groups. And that's important. So in, in total, it's also kind of a field of affordances. You could say possibilities uh, for action provided by the environment, also to temptate people and to, yeah, to activate this fort. So here you see all kinds of elements. The grass sculpture is continuously going through the fort, and actually all uh, kind of uh, historical elements from different periods, um, yeah, which are becoming one. So the, the fortress is every day recolonized. In the evening it's completely clean, and during the day it's colonized by people, and people are going to sit everywhere and just use it. And also, on the opposite, I think uh, if you have intensive, uh, there are really intensive places uh, in this Dutch waterline, so this, as this, uh, uh, this fortress is an example, but on the contrary, you also need empty spaces, so this is completely a void outside the fortress. And the municipality decided not to build houses there, and it was a very strategic decision because it's an open field, and now people really want to live there. So sometimes you also have to do nothing uh, or avoiding things or uh, postponing things to another period uh, to, to increase uh, value over time. That's also important. We don't have to solve everything today with Heritage, I think. Another cluster and a very important project is uh, Bunker 599 at a strategic location along the main highway through the Netherlands. And um, Bunker 599 is actually showing uh, an... Um, it's actually arguing the, the conservative uh, monumental policy also of UNESCO heritage, because this whole line is on the nomination of UNESCO heritage. And I think it's really good at some places there is happening nothing. It stays exactly the same. But this, exactly this spot along the highway, uh, asks for a kind of intervention and to make also visible what this whole system of the water line is about. This is really about a strategic intervention at one specific point you are tr trying to show a bigger system and that's what we try to do here by cutting a bunker going through this bunker this was a uh, proposal and everybody said of course it's impossible there is no money there is no this no that it's uh, technically impossible uh, but that's with a lot of our project they are seemingly impossible but luckily there was a, a huge ambition of the municipality and they uh, collected money to get it done here is the highway but this is, this is still a proposal of course what we wanted to do is to cut this bunker, and by cutting it, you are actually showing the inside of the 700 other bunkers as well. So it's a kind, also a kind of mental intervention. And it, it used to be a monument in advance, why, why we did it. It took us three years uh, to, get, uh, to convince everybody, but after we did it, it became a national monument. So that's what it is right now. So you enter, sorry, you are entering this area 
Here there is, is also the, the entrance of a nature area, but actually you show, the, you show the inside of a seemingly indestructible structure in this Dutch water line. The, the, pile, the pillars are extending this uh, view. You can see that, and they are also uh, emphasizing the inundation level of the former uh, uh, inundation fields, which used to be here. So actually this point is showing something on how we deal with cultural heritage and what it can mean, what the, yeah, actually on a larger scale uh, level. Inside it's like a fossil which has been cut. And also adopted by the whole, uh, uh, although in advance there was many discussion, but in the end people really liked it and every day there are people stopping and passing by and uh, having a little visit around this uh, spot. And this is an image uh, during uh, winter time. Now I'm going to give the microphone to Anna. She's going to do the second part of this uh, lecture. Thanks. So I'm going to show you a couple of projects that maybe uh, at this point seem also a bit impossible, uh, but we're working really hard on it to, uh, to make them <laughs> possible. So this is a project called After Image. Um, it's on this area. It's in the north of Holland, uh, city of Groningen. It's a really big area, 14 hectares big. Uh, and it was an old sugar factory. And because all the uh, sugar production, uh, uh, the European Union decided to move it to South America, uh, this one got closed uh, down in 2008. Um, and the municipality of Groningen actually made a radical decision to demolish this whole uh, area, or, or almost everything. Um, so it was a huge area that is um, yeah, now a, f a field with, uh, with concrete, and only there's one building and one chimney that is left over. Um, and now the municipality for the next 15 years is thinking of new ideas <coughs> to uh, redevelop it. Uh, so they're going to redevelop it uh, gradually. They're coming up with ideas that they're going to test out on this uh, area. Uh, and eventually, after 15 years, it will become a residential area. And we all know that with new residential areas, they lack also a kind of identity. And that's very, it's really a pity, because especially for this area, with a lot of history, it is not necessary. Uh, so the municipality asked us to uh, come up with an architectural intervention that tells us something about the history of this place, to also make it readable uh, for people again. So we went uh, out and, um, and got a lot of cons old construction drawings of this site. Uh, uh, we always do a lot of uh, cultural historical research and we found out that there's a huge world filled with concrete foundation pillars under the surface, so under the ground. Um, and we wanted to reveal that, so we took one silo of 40 um, meters in diameter uh, and we wanted to reveal this world of concrete pillars. So we made a, uh, we proposed a slope that goes down towards this uh, concrete uh, cathedral uh, filled with uh, filled with pillars. So you can go underneath, and it uh, will function as a public space for this area. So first, uh, invest in public space, and afterwards, uh, the residential area will uh, will get developed. So increase the the value before uh, even the development starts. Um, and it will function as a public space, so it will, can be used as a decor for theater, for, uh, for art, uh, for uh, performances, music, um, or it can just function as a, as a decor while you sit in the sun and uh, out of the wind. Another uh, project is uh, New Amsterdam Park, um, Trusted Subcultures, and maybe it's not di directly related to heritage, but it does tell us something about social cohesion, so that's why we wanted to show you uh, this one. Um, and it's a floating park uh, on, the on the water and it consists of uh, 30 barges. Um, and th those barges are the basic structure of the park. And the barges were used to transport all sorts of goods. But what is more important is what, what happens inside the barges and what we uh, propose. So we actually uh, start from out the concept of the stranger. Um, and uh, we want to, uh, to, to uh, give these spaces to subcultures. So not starting from uh, people with, uh, with different religions or ethnicities, uh, but really people with shared interests and flexible patterns uh, of behavior. And we want to combine them with, uh, with social affordances. So for example, Ronald already explained it, uh, a chair is an affordance to sit down, uh, but a campfire is an affordance to gather around together and to warm up. Um, and when you combine these two, um, we, we think we can make conditions for people to become trusted, familiar uh, strangers. 
So this is a schematic uh, way. So you here see different subcultures, um, and these are different social affordances. Uh, and by combining these, uh, this is a, a big section of the of the floating park, um, and it consists out of out of a grid of uh, three different types of spaces. So these are the water streets. So you can uh, enter it by by a boat. Um, and this is, for example, also a barge filled with uh, um, a, a park. Um, and you can also see that there are, there are some pathways that go overhead. Um, so people can choose if they want to enter uh, a, a certain subculture or not, or if they want to stay uh, more, uh, more in distance. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an art barge. Uh, here you see, for example, on the left, you see a uh, graffiti barge, uh, you see a Kwaku festival, Barge Kwaku festival is an important festival for people from a Suriname uh, background in the Netherlands, a tipi barge, a goth barge. So they're specifically designed for these subcultures. They can really colonize these, uh, these barges. And this is, for example, uh, social affordance, so people uh, from all sorts of interests can meet here because it's not only for one subculture, but it's... Um, it's really about confronting subcultures with each other and not that they ha always have to blend, but they can choose if they want to enter each other's world or not. So then you get a really diverse uh, world uh, in the middle of the city. One project that we're also working on at the moment, and we don't have a lot of images for this project because it's really, uh, we, we just got working uh, on it, so uh, it's not finished uh, yet, but it's called Campus of, uh, of Amsterdam. Um, it actually started out uh, with an area that's in the middle of the center of Amsterdam. Um, it's called the Marine Area, the Naval Site. It's been closed off for 350 years. And what is really special about that area is that there the ships uh, were made that went to the Dutch colonies, because the Netherlands uh, had colonies in Suriname, in Indonesia, uh, Curaçao, and also other countries. And actually, the, the reason why our society is so diverse today is because these ships went, uh, went abroad. Uh, so it was the first bridge over the world, um, or towards the world, from the Netherlands. So uh, there was an exchange of products, of people, of cultures, of ideas. Um, and a lot of people in the Netherlands don't, um, don't realize that, that it started out a really, really long time ago, this exchange between cultures um, and identities. So um, what we propose is to uh, build on this area in the center of Amsterdam, because it now it, this area opened up and they don't know what to do with it, and also not, to, not, not how to show this important history of Amsterdam. And actually everyone in Amsterdam is a newcomer. Um, and, and to realize that, you have to first realize where you all come from. So we propose to build a 3D compass, so really three-dimensional compass that is carved out of a space where all the wind directions are in. Um, and we're going to collaborate with history teachers from every first grade high school uh, in Amsterdam. We're going to ask uh, the students of these first grade uh, schools from the history class to, um, to find out who the grandmother of their grandmother was. So they have to really do personal historical research. Uh, they have to find out who that person was, when is she born, uh, how did her daily life look like, and where is she born. Um, and then afterwards they have to stand in this three-dimensional compass, in the wind direction where their ancestor is from, and they have to tell each other stories uh, about what they found out. And um, the nice thing about that is that an, uh, a person or a kid with an ancestor from Turkey, for example, has to stand in the same wind direction as a, uh, a, a kid with ancestors in uh, Indonesia or in the southeast of the Netherlands. Um, so hopefully with that, um, uh, the kids will get more, yeah, a wider view of the world, that it's bigger than only the place where they are uh, from. Um, so, and at the end, we will ask them to write down the names of their ancestor and also their own name and birth uh, year uh, with a uh, phosphor uh, pencil. So you only see it when it completely, completely gets dark. So when the campfire uh, goes out, um, uh, you, you, the names appear. And also this campfire is, of course, one of the social affordances, which we really like because people yeah, can gather around it and warm up and tell each other stories. Well, and uh, Secret Operation 610, um, 
Ronald told uh, told about it. It's a really special project for us. It was some kind of it was actually a dream to work uh, in a place like that. It's um, on a military airbase Susterberg in the middle of Holland. And when we came there, we we saw this. It was just an empty Cold War uh, area with an empty uh, airbase. Uh, we had the key of it. Uh, we were the only ones there. Uh, so it was really a, <laughs> a big treat for us <coughs> to uh, to be there. And on this uh, area, there are a lot of uh, these shelters, uh, 16, they, uh, they housed uh, F-15 uh, aircraft, so these aircrafts could, uh, could, could fly away on every moment when, when it was needed during the Cold War. And five of these shelters uh, got a culture function, uh, and our client asked us to um, make a yeah, multifunctional piece of furniture in, this, uh, in, in one of these shelters, in, in shelter with the number 610. Um, and first we looked, of course, at the, at the qualities, spatial qualities of this area. Um, so on the red circle on the left, uh, that is our shelter. This is the landing strip. It's five kilometers long, 50 meters uh, wide. Um, but this, uh, th these spatial qualities are also formed by the history of the place. Uh, so in the beginning of the 20th century, aviation pioneers like Anthony Fokker did their first aviation tests on this area. Um, and uh, also flying was a big attraction because people never seen it before. Um, so they really went to this place to look at this phenomenon of flying. And afterwards, during the Cold War, it became a completely closed off area. You could not enter. Uh, there was a lot of noise from these aircrafts coming in and out. Um, and actually now it's, uh, it's vacant and the province decided to make a high quality nature area uh, out of this whole area. And that means that there are a lot of restrictions, a, ro a lot of rules regarding nature. So it's not allowed to make noise, it's, uh, emissions are not allowed. Um, and also what is the most sad part of it is that uh, the province is removing uh, asphalt roads uh, to make new nature. But for us that's really demolition of, uh, of heritage. Um, so we, we actually decided also to fight against that. So we designed some kind of Trojan horse also that needs uh, this asphalt uh, to survive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we also uh, uh, looked at bigger ambitions in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands has a knowledge and innovation agenda that for 2030 says uh, that they want to be uh, CO2 neutral, so no emissions uh, and no noise. So we found out that they actually have the same ambitions as the nature development, only the outcome is different. And mm. one, at the one ambition, uh, flying is allowed, but then without emission, without noise, and with the other one, uh, nothing is allowed. Uh, so we wanted to combine these uh, two and to see how far we could uh, we could go um, so but this new f uh, new flying of the 21st century this ambition for 2030 um, it's also about testing so a lot of universities technical universities companies are making new products that are really innovative and uh, like for example uh, planes that fly on sun panels um, and uh, something a thing like this like the flying car but they all need testing space so real testing space in real life so not only uh, wind turbines inside but real testing place and there of course we have a vacant uh, uh, vacant landing strip so the connection was easily made for us so we started collaborating also with Technical University of Delft and what is the funny thing is that uh, this innovation is mostly also um, it's also uh, based on uh, techniques that ca that come from nature uh, and animals and uh, and birds. Uh, so they use also this nature to come up with the most innovative uh, uh, flying uh, objects. So we wanted to make uh, for these for these people that make these tests for these companies and universities, we wanted to make some kind of base, a laboratory where they can do these tests in and where they can work out from, but also that they can move uh, through this whole uh, air base so they can move from the shelter towards the landing strip and all over around. So they also need the asphalt, of course. Um, and as an object, we wanted to design something that also kind of looked like that F-15 that, uh, that looks really sharp at you when these doors open. So we started working on this uh, airbase two days a week uh, for a year to also get this feel of this cold war, of this, of this area, to, to, to taste the atmosphere, uh, to come up with the best design. And also testing a uh, out a lot ourselves, of course, playing around there was, uh, was really a lot of fun. So eventually when the doors open of the shelter, um, this uh, 
thing comes out, Secret Operation 610. Um, and it can go to the landing strip. But it goes in a very slow pace, so it's three kilometers an hour that it uh, moves. So it's a very slow uh, movement on this airbase that is completely quiet uh, now. And on the inside, it's a comfortable space where, uh, where, where you have chairs. And so these chairs can flip over, the table can come electrically out of the ceiling. Uh, so it's some kind of spaceship also that can transform <coughs> inside. So and also you can climb up uh, uh, with these on these legs to the top. And also this, of course, had a lot of public attention and people really wanted to see it. Uh, um, and in 2013, 2014, and still now, also we have a big testing phase where we invite different companies or they call us to test, uh, to test this object and to use it. Also to see what, what is the best use for it. Um, so, for example, this is the Dutch Cultural Heritage Board that had their uh, big meeting, director's meeting, inside uh, the object. They were the first group as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although they actually, the uh, Dutch Cultural Heritage Board is not thinking yet of Cold War heritage, but they did have their big meeting inside yeah. of here. So that's really special also. Um, so this is a company called We Transfer. Uh, this was during a festival, architecture film festival. So really different companies come, uh, come to, uh, to use it. Um, and this is the, the company that makes the flying car. They, they had a big workshop with uh, a medical firm called Mellon Medical, and uh, they wanted to have a big brainstorm. And because our thing is mobile, they, come, they, they came up with a mobile operation room. Um, so also this inspires, again, new ideas uh, and innovative ideas. I'm gonna show you now uh, a movie, so you can really get a feeling of the, of the project. Thanks so, for your attention. Thank you for your attention.